Hello, and welcome to yet another Retro Channel. I know you guys are probably expecting a midweek palate cleanser since I'm putting this out on Wednesday. But if you've been following my channel, you'll know that uh, for the past week and a half, two weeks, I have been absent. Uh, the reason for that is that my mother spent some time in the hospital. She's home now. She's doing well, so don't worry. I don't, uh, I don't need any, necessarily need any sympathy um, messages or anything like that. She is doing well. She's recovered from what was wrong, and, and the doctors uh, have a handle on how to, get, how to keep her well going forward. But I've had to spend some time, uh, you know, being there for her, being there for the family in her absence and taking care of things. And uh, I will probably have a few more time periods where I'm, uh, you know, kept away from, from my hobby. Obviously, family first, hobbies second. But in the meantime, I obviously haven't had time to do any videos, so there really isn't anything to cleanse your palate from, which is why this isn't a midweek palate cleanser, but a regular video. So we'll get through the intro and we'll get right into it. Uh, please stay tuned to the end and uh, I have a special announcement to make. So let's get right to it. Today is my first ever Septandi video. Uh, I've only been doing this uh, YouTube thing since February of this year, so I don't go back as far as September of last year. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start to take a look at this TRS-80 Color Computer 2. Now, um, this machine is actually working, as you can see on the screen. We've got extended color basic 1.1 and uh, this is if you call up the memory and i know you probably won't be able to see that on the screen but uh, reports 84 87 bytes free uh, what that indicates is that this is a 16k color computer too um, we have the multi keyboard multi key keyboard we don't have the the, the full size uh, I do have at least one machine, that uh, Coco 2, that does have the full size, but uh, this one doesn't. It's, as I say, it's 16K. It'll have the original uh, Motorola 6809 processor. So what we're going to do is we're going to give this thing the works. We're going to take it apart. We're going to clean it. Uh, there is a little bit of yellowing on the left side of the case, so it'll be going through uh, my RetroBright process, so I'll show you that. Um, I've been promising a RetroBright video for a while, so this is my opportunity to do that. Now, this thing isn't very yellowed. I do have some more yellowed um, Color Computer 2s, but unfortunately, uh, they were already 64K, so they wouldn't have given me the opportunity to do one of the other things I'm planning, which is some upgrades. I'm going to upgrade this to 64K. I'm going to install a Hitachi 6309 processor. Uh, I'm going to give it uh, composite output. That's all I can think of at the moment. There is a, a possible surprise at the end of the month, uh, depending on how far I get with it. Um, we may be looking at uh, a possible, well, I'll leave it as a surprise for the end of the month. So um, if we don't get to that, I apologize. And like I said, it'll depend on how far I get with it, but we'll see how it goes. So what we need to do, first of all, is take this thing apart so we can do some cleaning. That's the first stage. Um, by the way, for those of you who don't know this, um, I see this question asked a lot where people want to uh, get out their old uh, computer or their old gaming console and connect it to a modern TV to play it. There are a lot of solutions for that. Um, and possibly the simplest one and maybe even the cheapest are these. This little device goes from an RCA jack 
to a coaxial connector. And if you have a TV that still has a coaxial RF input that has an analog tuner attached to it. So if you can still tune analog channels on your television, even though they're not being broadcast anymore, um, this device is all you need. You can usually pick these up in two packs from Amazon or anywhere else. Look for Atari RCA adapter. This little device replaces one of those big switch boxes that you used to get with the switch to go from TV to computer or TV to game. Um, this little device does what that does just without the switch because you obviously no longer need to switch back and forth between uh, an analog antenna and um, your computer or game consoles uh, output. You just need this. This is essentially a matching transformer. It takes uh, uh, it takes 300 ohm and converts it to 75 ohm, or the other way around. I forget which way it is, but this is all you need, and an, and an RCA cable. So what I did to hook up the uh, the Coco to that TV you saw is I simply connected this to the RF output. Have make sure I'm selected to the right channel that I want, channel three or channel four. And then this other end connects to that, and that screws into that coaxial connector on the back of your TV. And then you'll probably need to do a channel scan. Most modern TVs have a channel scan function, and it should identify the channel. If you've turned the computer on, you, you have to turn it on, turn the computer or the console on, do the channel scan, and it should find the channel that, uh, that it's on. But that's all you really need for that. And I see that question a lot, like I said, in... Uh, Facebook posts and in, in forum posts where people want to hook up their old Atari 2600 or Nintendo or whatever to a modern TV, this little device will do in most cases. Now, there are a lot of other solutions. Uh, there are ways you can modify the console or the computer. There are ways you can, uh, there are uh, external adapters that you can use. Um, uh, open source scan converters, they're, they're, those are rather expensive. There are, there's the RetroTink and a few other ways that you can uh, can possibly hook up your old device to a modern TV. But for simplicity and cost effectiveness, these little things are great. So, back to the Coco. As I said, it's time to disassemble. Now, this Coco, uh, it's dirty. It's a little yellowed, on, mostly on the left. The right's pretty good. Um, we look at the bottom. We have all the stickers. And in this case, we're, well, we're missing one foot. Um, but the warranty seal has never been broken here. This computer has never been opened. So we are going to have to break that seal to do this. Oh, where's the other screwdriver? Left it in the other room. I've been uh, building a new production PC where I do my editing and, and uh, rendering of the videos that you see. Uh, the one I was working with was pretty slow and I needed to speed things up. So I built a new one and this one was in there. Now, you're going to notice when you take these screws out that there are short ones and there are long ones. So, here's a short one, and I will get one of the long ones out. Well, maybe, maybe not. Huh, this one seems to have all short. Um, there should be short ones in the front and long ones in the back. And you don't want to, if that's the case, you don't want to get them mixed up. Um, however, these all seem to be short ones. You don't want to get them mixed up because if you try to put a long one in the front, you will poke through or try to poke through the front or the top of the case. You don't want to do that. So be careful when you're disassembling and reassembling a Coco to get the screws in the right place. Now, our last screw is here under the warranty sticker. And did 
doesn't want to come out. It's loose, it's just not wanting to fall out of the come on. It'll come out when we take the cut top off. Okay, so there's the top removed. We're looking pretty clean inside, but we are going to wash this thing thoroughly. Uh, that's necessary not just to, to clean it up, but also uh, for the retro brighting process. You don't want any contaminants or oils on the surface. You want the peroxide solution to be able to get to it evenly all across the board. Uh, the computer itself, you can see the uh, motherboard, everything inside is pretty dusty. Let's see if that screws. Come on. There we go. There's the last screw. Okay. So everything's pretty dusty in here. You can see the difference between the dusty exposed plastic and the... Uh, plastic that was hidden inside the case. To continue this, we need to remove the keyboard ribbon cable carefully. Now these can be, um, you know, they can become fragile over time. The plastic can get brittle, it can crack. This one is in pretty good shape, so we're going to uh, set that aside. Uh, we will be disassembling this keyboard and giving it a good clean inside and out, cleaning the keys. Uh, cleaning the mylar uh, uh, membrane that's inside. And now we have the motherboard exposed. Well, I should I'm sure pull that. We weren't on, but I still had the power plugged in, so the transformer was still alive. You have to be careful because there is high voltage here. As you see, this one is not protected. Some of them have cages around them. Some of them have some of the older ones have uh, cardboard shields, uh, but this one is just wide open here. Um, so that, that live uh, voltage was coming in here, and I could have, if I'd touched those while that was still plugged in, I could have uh, seriously shocked myself or possibly even killed myself uh, by doing that. So you have to be very careful around this transformer. This does not have, uh, the Coco doesn't have an external power supply. It's an internal unit. It's all in, it's all in here. All the voltage um, conversion and regulation is done in this area of the board. Um, so you have to be very careful with this. Be careful particularly with uh, this capacitor. The leads, uh, the, this capacitor will probably have a charge on it if you've had it plugged in in any, in any recent uh in any recent time frame, that capacitor will probably have a charge on it. So if you touch the leads on the bottom, you can zap yourself even when it's not plugged in. Uh, generally, just be very, very careful around any power supply um, when you're working with it. Now, there are three leads that come off the transformer and uh, connect to the board. There's these two. And they go, you know, they come from the transformer. The top one goes to the lead on the outside. The bottom one goes to the lead on the inside. And then the black one connects down here. These are simple spade connectors, so not too much trouble. Um, you'll see the transformer is fused, so um, if you have trouble getting your Coco to power on, one of the first things you want to check is that fuse. Uh, now we'll move these leads aside, and we're going to go ahead and remove the motherboard. There are two screws here and actually I need a slightly smaller screwdriver and 
Now these screws are about the same length as the case, as the, as the shorter case screws, but they'll have a slightly smaller head and they, they have a, uh, a wider thread and a narrower shaft. So uh, we, when you go to put them back, put it back together, you'll want to make sure that you get the order correct. The other screws are on the cartridge connector, the uh, ROM pack connector. Two more. And now the board is free. Okay. Now you can see the board is pretty dusty, pretty dirty. We are going to wash the board. I know some of you may cringe at that, but uh, it's perfectly safe. As long as you make sure you let it dry thoroughly afterwards. Uh, what I do, and you'll see this, I'm going to actually show it this time, is I wash the board with a soft bristled brush. I, I put it in, uh, I use a, a sink full of warm soapy water and a soft bristled brush to clean it very thoroughly. And then once it's cleaned, I use an air compressor uh, to blow it as dry as possible. And then after that, um, I will let it air dry for at least a day before I put any power to it. So it will be thoroughly cleaned and dried before it comes back to be worked on. Um, I will probably go ahead before I wash it and use deoxit on all the sockets. Um, that way I will clean the contacts and then uh, the washing process will clean up any residue of the, uh, the deoxit. Um, you can, if you, if you feel it necessary, you can remove the chips that are in sockets before cleaning. Um, that way you clean underneath the sockets. So underneath the sockets, it shouldn't be very dirty. Um, it also leaves it open so that you, um, so that it'll dry better with the chips out. Uh, I will probably leave the chips on this one. Uh, you also want to be careful of the RF can. You probably want to remove the shields so that uh, water won't be held inside. Um, if it gets in there, you'll just go ahead and, and clean it without the, uh, the shields on or the uh, shell lid covers on. Um, and I guess the next thing to do is to remove the RF shield from the bottom. And this just has, unlike a, a Commodore, for instance, it has these clips that just clip it on. Now you can, if you want, re return this shield after, uh, you know, after you do all your all the work you're going to do on it. You can return this shield, or you can throw it away. Uh, these days, these shields serve very little purpose. They're very hard to get off. Um, they don't serve much purpose anymore because of uh, changes in the RF or in the usage of the RF spectrum, even in America. Um, those of you who might have these in Europe, it may or may not even have the shield. Uh, you'll want to at least uh, keep these clips. These clips uh, support the keyboard. So you'll, you'll not want to throw the clips away, even if you do throw the shield away. The three clips in the front, like I said, they support the keyboard. Try not to bend them when you're taking them off. So here's the shield on the bottom. We've now got all the clips off and it just lifts away. It's just a piece of cardboard with uh, aluminum film on one side, gold film on the other. Not gold, but gold in. And like I said, you can either keep that or toss it. 
Looking at the bottom of the board, you'll see that there are two capacitors that are mounted to the bottom. Um, these, this was done because if they're mounted to the top, they're too close to the heat sink for the voltage regulator. Uh, that gets awfully hot and you don't want to cook your caps. Um, so they mounted them to the bottom. Now, if you want to, uh, if you want to replace your regulator, um, with something more modern, you can, something that doesn't produce as much heat. If you do that, you can relocate those caps to the top. I've done that in the past for certain boards, uh, but this one I'll probably leave as is. And as we said, the board was virgin when I opened it. Uh, it had never been opened before, so we don't see any rework, any evidence of rework. We'll just see uh, some instances of flux on connectors that were hand soldered. But otherwise, everything should be uh, should be untouched here. So let me go ahead, go ahead and take the RF can lid off, lids off. I'm going to remove both of them. The upright ones can be a little finicky. Um, later RF modulators were mounted flat to the board rather than vertically. Uh, this is one of the earlier models. Having a little difficulty wiggling the lid out from under the modulator. There we go. Okay, there's the modulator open. And now this is ready for cleaning. As I said, I, I will probably go ahead and uh, deoxid that before putting it through the bath. Now we need to take the transformer out of the case. The mains wire goes through some strain relief before it gets to the transformer. And then there are two screws. Again, if this were still plugged in, it would be awfully dangerous for me to do this because I'm working right next to the uh, mains connection to the transformer here. Let's go ahead and unscrew these two screws and the transformer should lift away there we go now we can give the transformer a bit of a wipe down but you don't want to probably give it a bath and you can of course wipe down the, the cord and now we have the case and the next thing we need to do is remove the cartridge door rom pack door and you just need to pull, sorry, you just need to pull the side back a little bit enough to get the little nub of the door out. And then the other side will pop right out. You'll notice there's a spring. You want to be careful to keep track of that spring because otherwise your door won't spring back when you put it back together. So, again, dusty but not particularly dirty on the inside. On the back. Now, um, before I do wash this, I am going to protect <coughs> all the stickers. And I'm going to do that by um, using some packing tape, but you don't want to put the packing tape directly on the stickers. Um, it'll either pull the sticker away or it will pull the ink off of these stickers. I've had that happen, so I know, I know that I've learned that lesson. So... What you want to do is put down a layer of saran wrap or, or some kind of protective film before you use the tape to tape around it and seal it in. So I will do that before I um, do the cleaning. Uh, as I said, we've got a we've lost a foot, so I can use some IPA, probably.
So I can use some IPA to get the residue of the adhesive off. I hope I'd be able to. It's okay. So if you run into that situation where you can't get the adhesive off with IPA, you'll want to use a spudger. And I'm going to use this plastic spudger to help uh, prevent scraping the plastic underneath. So I'm just going to um, go ahead and give it some more IPA and then use the plastic spudger to scrape away the residue got most of it off um, the retro brighting process won't damage the feet so I'm going to leave them on the next thing I'm going to do is very delicate um, I'm going to remove the badge and we'll replace it afterwards now, this badge is already coming up a little bit but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my hot air station. I'm going to use very cool hot air. I'm going to start at 120. And I'm just using this to loosen the adhesive. And then I'm going to use a spudger to gently lift the badge away. And the reason I want to be gentle because these are aluminum and they will bend. So if you want to be able to put it back uh, the way it was and not notice that it's been pulled off, you need to try to avoid bending it. So I just need to, like I said, use the hot air to loosen the adhesive. And then I will slowly use the spudger to pull it up. I'm going to do this very slowly, very gently, like I said, to avoid bending the aluminum in the process. You also don't want to use too much heat. That's why I'm only doing 120C uh, because you don't want to melt the plastic underneath either. You don't want to bend the aluminum or melt the plastic of the case. Slowly and gently. Should be popping loose any moment. go. Very nice, very nice about to pop this from the spudger. It's gonna be awfully hot so careful with it. But you can see that it came away almost completely straight, almost completely flat. And now you just need to reapply some adhesive, uh, double-sided sticky tape. You can use that when you when it's done being cleaned and put back together. And you'll be able to put that right back on and no one will ever know it was taken off. So in the meantime, again, a little IPA to clean the adhesive. All right. There is the case and the door ready to be cleaned. 
Uh, as I said, I would deox it. All the sockets. Give the switch a little squirt. And then the motherboard is ready to be washed. Now we have to address the keyboard. Okay, now we're going to remove the keycaps. And to do that, I'm using a key puller. These are just a few bucks. You can get them on Amazon or AliExpress or uh, probably Mauser, DigiKey. They're worth the. They're definitely worth the investment if you're going to be working on keyboards. And you just slide the wings over the key. Give it a little twist so that the Key puller is under the key and just pull straight up. And there is your key. You can do that for all of them until you get to the space bar and that one will be a little different. As I said, the space bar will be a little different. And we need to use a spudger or a screwdriver to wedge in there. Its switch is in the middle. And there is a stabilizer bar that goes in. So uh, we will need to remove that. And it will require some lubrication before we put it back together. But it's pretty fuzzy as you can see so it'll be cleaned first and there's the space bar yeah. and then as you can see there's a lot of fluff and dust that gets down between the keys and in there so we'll be cleaning all of this as well the next step is to remove all these little teeny tiny screws and some of you will have iFixit kits or something the like uh, that you can use for this. I use a set of jeweler screwdrivers that I've had for uh, ages. Be careful not to lose these little screws. Uh, if you hadn't noticed, I use a little, this is a magnetic tray, so it helps to keep things from going flying everywhere. And I just love those little things. You can remove these in any order, but I recommend when you put them back in, in case I forget to tell you this, when it comes time to reassemble, I recommend using diagonal patterns uh, so that you get the mounting pressure uh, even across the PCB or the uh, membrane PCB inside. Now you can lift away the back plate. Of course, we'll give that a wipe down, but it's not that dirty. And you have the exposed membrane now. The membrane has these little rubber bumpers on this version of the keyboard. So you're going to want to take these and put them somewhere safe. And we have the membrane. Now this membrane works. It's got three layers. Um, that 
when the keys are pressed, they push the top layer down to contact with the bottom layer through gaps in the middle layer. So if you're having trouble with your keyboard operation, you may need to open this, open these membranes up and just wipe those contacts. Not they are fused together at the corners. So it's hard to do unless you're willing to go ahead and pop those. But if you if you are, you can pop those loose in the corners, like so. They're just adhesive. Pop these two loose carefully. And I guess there are some more down here. Pop those loose. It'll fold open. The middle layer of the membrane, as I said, is just to keep them to keep them separated until they're pressed. So you just leave that where it is. And these are little carbon covered contacts. And what you want to do, just very gently, very gently with a little bit of alcohol. You don't want to use contact cleaner because you could wipe away the carbon with a little bit of alcohol on a uh, soft rag, something like microfiber, just give them a brush over just to clean contaminants that might be there. There shouldn't be any the way the membrane is designed, but it is possible. So if you need to clean it, that's how to do it. I'm going to leave this one as it is for now. Reattach the adhesives. I think that membrane's probably in pretty good shape, so I'm going to leave it alone. And then we have the rest of the little rubbers that rubber rubber uh, domes that didn't stick to the membrane. Take them, keep them separate, separate and safe. And then you've got the um, key posts themselves. Those will just fall out if you turn it over. usually okay now the top plate is ready for cleaning and these don't really need cleaning so I will just put them safely with the rubber domes and there we go there's our keyboard disassembled so that's everything we need to take apart. Now the uh, the keycaps themselves will go in warm soapy water and get cleaned, um, individually wiped down uh, with a microfiber cloth and then allowed to dry. The top cover of the keyboard will uh, get washed and uh, we'll see what we can do about getting some of this stuff that's down in the crevices out. And then we will treat this with 303 protectant uh, to bring back the, the luster of the black. So it's on to cleaning time. Okay, so I've completed washing the motherboard in the case. Unfortunately, in doing that, I did screw up. I tried to set up a, a portable recording station and I screwed up and I lost all that video. But that does give me an opportunity. That case was in pretty good shape. It had some marks on it uh, that were able to be cleaned uh, with a combination of a magic eraser and um, some baking soda and a toothbrush. But once it was done, there was very little yellowing on the case. So the retro bright portion, it's just unnecessary for that case. I may actually put it in for maybe an hour. Um, it'll probably clear uh, what light yellowing there is on it. But what I've decided to do instead for the retro brighting, a cleaning and retro brighting portion is I'm going to record a separate video where I work on this machine. This uh, color computer, another color computer too. This one's a 64K version already, which is why I didn't pick it in it originally. Um, 
This one obviously has quite a bit more yellowing on it. Um, as you can see in the image, that's not that's not uh, picture correction that needs to be done. That's actually that's actually what this thing looks like. It's very yellowed. So I will uh, wash this one and retro bright it in a separate video so you can see my retro brighting process. But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead with the restoration and upgrade on the machine we've been working on. So, and that, that retro brighting video will probably be a midweek video. So watch for that. It'll still be a Septandi video. Um, in the meantime, here is the motherboard. Um, it's now been washed. It's nice and shiny clean. You could eat off of it. And it needs to continue to air dry for not quite another day. Uh, but it'll be ready uh, to proceed with the upgrades in about 20 hours time. In the meantime, we can work on rebuilding the keyboard. Now this is the top keyboard plate and you can see that cleaned up very nicely. All the, the dust is gone and I have applied 303 protectant. Uh, so the black, uh, it's textured, but you can tell that it, it seems to have more of its luster back. So we will now begin the process of rebuilding. And to do that, we need the key stems and the rubber um, rubber domes. Yeah, the key stems are keyed and I didn't realize it. Um, there is a small nub inside each one and for them to fit correctly there's a uh, I don't know if you can see it but there is a slot at the top of the mounting point on the key so all of these have to be facing up and I did not do that so I get to take it all apart again isn't that fun As we put the key stems back in, you'll notice there is a small keying point in each of the key stems that needs to face the top of the keyboard. And we will, to make things easier, we'll grab a couple of books and we will use them to prop up the keyboard. And then we start putting these in. Making sure to get all the little keying points facing upward. Next, we reseat the rubber domes, and all we have to make sure of here is that when they're seated in, that they're flush with the top of the um, ring around the uh, mounting hole. Now, before I put the membrane back, I am going to take the precaution of putting the mounting plate on to hold everything in place. Oops. I have to put it on the right way. It should slip onto a couple of little nubs. There we go. That'll hold everything in place and then I'm going to flip it over and make sure that I have all the stems put in with the keying point 
in the upward position. It's a pain to take it apart again and fix them if you didn't. Okay, they're all correct. So now we'll bring in the membrane. And again, the membrane should fit on top of these little stems that hold it in position, the correct position. And finally, the backing plate, which again goes over those two little stems that position it correctly. Now it's just a matter of putting back all those tiny little screws. And like I said originally, we want to put them in in a cross pattern. So I'll do this one and then the one at the lower left and upper left and lower right and keep going alternating until I fill them all in. And that's to make sure that the mounting pressure is even so that everything stays lined up. And as you do this, turn backwards until you hear a click or feel a click and then screw it in so you don't cross thread. Okay. Now we just need to put back the keycaps. And to start with, we'll put the space bar on. Give it a lubri little lubrication at each end for the point where it goes through the brackets on the key. This is just some silicone lubricant. And you want this to go through the little holes. Like that. And then... We put the stabilizer in the groove, tilt it down, and line up the guides, and the key goes into place. And then we start with the other keys. I'm going to get a photograph up so I know where the keys go. Or Actually, I've got another keyboard sitting right here below me, so I'll use that as a guide. Easy ones first. Okay, and there we go. One restored keyboard. Next, we'll be looking at the motherboard and some upgrades for that. Um, we'll be right into that in a few moments. And uh, that's actually going to do it for today. We'll get back to this in the next video. I have been doing a little work off camera. I have put together a new UVD board um, that I'll be integrating into this build so we can have uh, composite output. I'm working on a way to integrate it. I uh, cleaned out the RF modulator can and I'm going to try to do this without uh, modifying the case. I don't want to have to drill or cut the plastics of the case. Uh, so. I'm going to try to use the can uh, for the output, and I'm working on a solution for that. But like I said, that'll do it for today, and we'll get back to this later. Uh, there will, as I said, be a uh, retro writing video uh, using the other cocoa. That'll be coming up probably as a midweek palate cleanser. And I want to thank you all for viewing, and uh, if you've enjoyed the video, I know it's... Uh, we haven't got to the meat of it yet, but 
If you've enjoyed it, give it a like, thumbs up. Uh, that helps the channel out a lot immensely, and it, it helps uh, YouTube to suggest this video to more folks. Leave a comment in the comment section below. That also helps, and I love it talking to you guys. You guys have given me a lot of great ideas, and uh, you've been very generous with your compliments and and also your criticisms, and I, I love those too because I make plenty of mistakes, and I'm probably going to make some more here. But I, uh, I, I love learning from what you tell me, so keep it up. Share this out to your social media, to your friends, and uh, that also helps uh, getting more views. And I love to get more viewers and, and more subscribers. Um, let's see. Uh, thank you to my patrons. Uh, their names are popping up on the screen now. And now for the special announcement, and it relates to Patreon. Um, my next live will be uh, at the end of October, uh, where I will be repairing a Commodore 64. And what I would like to do is offer you all the opportunity for one of you to uh, share the screen with me live and help me repair that Commodore 64 and to enter to be considered for that, all you need to do is be a patron uh, on October 1st. October 1st is when I will draw the name, and then I will announce it. So if you want to enter that and you're not already a patron, uh, jump over to patreon.com. The link is in the description below, and you can uh, sign up. Uh, all you have to do is be the minimum level. It doesn't even have to be you know one of the higher levels. Just be the minimum level. And you'll be entered for an opportunity to share the screen with me and help me and, and guide me through a Commodore 64 repair. So I'll draw the name on October 1st and then I'll get in contact with you and we will do a test run to make sure everything works. I've never tried uh, to share the screen before. but uh, So all you need to do is be a, a patron on October 1st. Obviously, you'll need to have a webcam or some form of camera and a decent internet connection. And uh, we'll have some fun on a live stream. I think that does it. So, um, everybody, have a great week. Stay safe and be well. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Until then, bye.